Hi everyone, my name is Yanis Fakinyansha and I'm happy to welcome you to the fifth episode of Reprogramming Strategies for Self-Renewal, the festival of conversations curated and conducted by Spanish writer and journalist specialized in technology and power, Marta Pena. Reprogramming consists of eight streaming events taking place on a monthly basis throughout the whole year. All previous episodes, as well as for the information about the series and its upcoming guests, are available on the project's website. Today, we are pleased to welcome the writer, composer, producer and leading scholar on the social implications of artificial intelligence, Kate Crawford. Her work focuses on large-scale data systems, machine learning and AI in the wider context of history, politics, labor and the environment. Kate has traveled the planet, visiting the sites that reveal the true costs of artificial intelligence as an extractive industry, consuming natural resources, labor, and vast quantities of data. In the process, she has also imagined better ways of building and deploying those technical tools in ways that empower people to improve their lives and communities. Her most recent book, Atlas of AI, Power, Politics and the Planetary Cost of Artificial Intelligence, has been published just recently by the Yale University Press. As usual, also this time, we have special guests in the studio with us, who in the second half of the event will enrich the conversation with their questions. Furthermore, we invite everyone out there to participate in the debate through the web chat available on the project's website which allows you to share thoughts, considerations, doubts, links with the rest of the community and ask questions to our guests. So here we go, Kate Crawford talking to Marta Pirano. Kate, Marta, thanks for accepting to be part of this. Take it away. Well, hi, everybody, and thank you, Janice, for the uh, kind introduction. and. Uh, um, here we go. Uh, Professor Kate Crawford starts her amazing, amazing new book by announcing that artificial intelligence is neither artificial nor intelligence because it is made of flesh and sweat and precambrian minerals and vast amount of fossil fuels. Neutral is another one of the things that artificial intelligence is not as it requires such a fantastical enormous amount of resources that it is ultimately designed to satisfy the needs of those few who can afford it. Today, this means, of course, uh, a very few wealthy nations, or should I say the military departments and the uh, spy agencies of those nations and a very small number of companies, of technology companies. So finally, the Atlas of AI is not a book about technology, it's a book about power. Who has it? How is it used? How is it disguised? And how much it costs to those of us that don't have it? Um, Professor Kate Crawford, when my girlfriends learned that I was going to be talking to you today, they went totally bananas. You're not only one of the most respected scholars in the field, but an absolute superstar. So in my name and the name of all the girls in tech that are thinking about becoming AI thinkers or researchers or uh, coders, uh, welcome to reprogramming. Hi, I think we're back. <laughs> I hope we are back because I can hear oh you. Oh my God, that didn't start well. My gosh. Well, can you hear me now, Marta? That's the important thing. I can, I can. I don't know, I'm wondering Sorry. right now, did you hear any of the things I said? I did and, and I could hear you and you could not hear me. So I think this is really a case of the networks rising up to try and stop us from having a very political conversation today. <laughs> but okay. um, all I was saying was, was to say, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you today and that I'm joining you from the other side of the planet, um, currently in Australia where it is the middle of the night and uh, hopefully the networks will be able to stay operational for our conversation. Let's see, let's see. Well, as I was trying to say before, 
uh, you have in fact published a guide to a country that is normally depicted as immaterial. Uh, I believe your vision for this uh, grant project started while you were working with brilliant designer and beloved uh, axioma collaborator Vlad and Joler uh, in the mapping of the entire life cycle of an AI, in this case, the Amazon Echo. So can you tell us how and why this project came to be? Happy to. I mean, I've been researching the uh, politics of artificial intelligence writ large for almost 20 years. And certainly so much of that work has been looking at the types of epistemological and philosophical underpinnings of large scale machine learning. But it was really when I met Vladan in 2016 that we actually had this extraordinary research experience. It, for me, it was a quite a transformative project. We were at a conference that was about voice-enabled AI. So you might think of Siri or Alexa or Cortana. And one of our tasks to ourselves was to try and draw the process by which, say, something like Alexa would actually be drawing data and interpreting voices. But very quickly, we realized that we wanted to go further back in the supply chain to look at the beige cylinder of uh, Amazon Echo and to open it up and to say, where do these components come from? Where are they mined? Where are they smelted? How are they shipped around the world? And then also all the way to the end of life, where are they disposed of in e-waste tips and places like Ghana and Pakistan? So certainly to commence a project like that was such a different process, um, certainly to, to my usual experience in archives or you know, in, in journal uh, articles to really sort of put ourselves in the material production channels of artificial intelligence. And so it was in doing that project that I realized that I wanted to expand from looking at a single AI consumer device, which is, of course, you know, the Amazon Echo, and then to look at the entire AI industry. And so I'm wondering, during that project, what were the challenges? Like, what were the, where were the places, the the you know the things that you could not resolve? Like, what what was mm -hmm. left unresolved in that project? It's so interesting about that project is that I think it's it's very much for us uh, a project that will always continue. It, it can never be completely resolved. In many ways, the way that AI is spoken about is as black a black box, a technical black box that is impossible to open and fully understand. But what we discovered in doing that project was that there are black boxes on top of black boxes on top of black boxes. You can certainly start with a technical layer, but you need to consider the other strata, including the legal layer, the fact that so many of the companies that create these systems are protected by trade secrecy laws and proprietary information. You also have to think at the layer of the supply chain itself, which you know certainly at the level of mining um, is an industry which is extremely occluded and difficult to study and research um, for many reasons, including the fact that so many of the basic minerals that are used in planetary scale computation from cobalt to lithium uh, produced in conditions that are extremely difficult, often in uh, situations of extreme conflict. So again, for researchers to be opening up these systems is to always be unresolved, to know that you can ask questions but not always have complete answers. So for me, it was about that experience of opening up some of the hardest questions around how large scale industrial computation works and how it intersects with other forms of power. So do you feel that in, in between that project and this book, uh, which you were writing, of course, at the same time, uh, because mm. I hear it took you five years to write this book, which it sounds like a miracle, really, such an accomplished um, uh, research. I wonder if any of those black boxes were finally opened for this uh, for this new project. Like, did you manage to unscrew <laughs> some of those uh, tops? I think, in this sense, it's it's more like looking at where all of these various forms of systems are interlaced and where they connect. 
So in that sense, I'm, I'm far less interested in the magician's trick of complete transparency. I simply don't think such a thing is possible uh, in the stage of capitalism in which we inhabit. But I do think we can look transversally. We can actually look at the way in which various types of economic strata are actually built upon each other and sometimes illuminate ways in which they are actually connected. So in this sense, you know, the project of Atlas of AI is really trying to look at the broader political economy of artificial intelligence and, and rather than unmasking it completely in its, in its sort of transparent processes, to look at the ways in which it is both hidden and revealed to us through these sort of very specific layers, through the extraction from the earth, through labor, through data, and of course, through the operations of the state. So in that sense, you know, I think uh, for me as a researcher, it, it is an ongoing quest to understand these political and epistemological formulations, and that's going to take a very long time. Hmm. Well, I mean, first of all, let me remind our listeners that you can send your own questions for Kate uh, and, and write them on the chat box provided by Axioma. Um, I remember like when looking at the anatomy of AI, thinking that this dissection that you were doing with Vladin had to rely on something like this kind of astronomical observations, no? Like when you send radio to the stars and you see what comes back just to guess, uh, to derive some knowledge about its journey. But in the Atlas, you also uh, take the explorer road and go visit these places like a lithium mine to see how the extraction is made and what the impact uh, is on the place and the people uh, involved, the people not only that work on it, but that they leave around it. Um, you go to the Amazon warehouses where uh, humans work among the robots um, and you describe it as bodies integrated in the matrix, which is the real word for uh, for the uh, I don't know um, uh, digital arrangement uh, that they have in the in the spaces um, like as if human bodies were mechanical parts, no that that watch that are watched over by by an, an like an enormous surveillance uh, mechanism, and um, and 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 I was wondering if I mean. Because you also display all this knowledge that you derive from the, you know, the astronomical observations and the uh, and the um, the your, your visits, your exploration of the uh, physical spaces into this layer uh, kind of uh, uh, interlaced, uh, you know, um, display that you call an atlas, uh, a little bit in the manner of. I guess of uh, Benjamin Bratton's the stack, who of course you uh, you thank profusely in the book. Um, but thinking as a journalist, and especially thinking uh, about my fellow journalists that are working uh, on this field from their newspapers and you know and their their very um, uh, um, distant uh, spaces from the places where all this is happening. What would be the tools uh, that, 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 that we would need to develop in order to research and describe this hyper object of the digital world? I love the way you frame this question and it, and it contains so much within it. And, and let me begin first at the methodological layer. So part of what I did in the Atlas is to really go to the places of extraction, to go to the mines, to go to the shipping nodes and warehouses, to go to the archives and to go to the labs where the data sets are created that drive machine learning. And part of this obviously is the process of what it is to ground artificial intelligence, to actually connect it to its modes of production that are so often kept away. And, and that is, I think, really part of the process of artificial intelligence. I, I, I refer to in the book, the work of Hart and Negri, who talk about the dual operation of abstraction and extraction. And it is precisely by abstracting away the processes of how AI is made that it can actually persist as an extractive industry. And so in that sense, it's actually part of the 
argument of the book is that we can no longer look at these systems as abstract, as immaterial, as ones and zeros floating in the cloud. We actually have to go to their locations of production. In that sense, it meant leaving the algorithmic nowhere space of machine learning and going to the specific locations and the spaces where people and institutions make choices. So in that sense, you know, as a method, the way that the book is researched and written is as much a way of seeing as it is a resistance to that type of immaterial uh, discussion and discourse around AI. Um, so if I, if I was to really engage with your provocation, which is how might journalists begin to research these systems differently, I think it begins on the ground. I think it begins on the actual places on the planet where you can see these systems actually being built from the ground up. And, and in that sense, it actually requires this wider lens. I love that you use the idea of sort of, you know, astronomical tools that we need to look further afield. And part of this too is to say, rather than simply thinking about, you know, a system at its sort of technical beginning and end, how do we think of its full life? How do we begin from birth to death? And in that sense, I think for journalists, it means asking deeper questions around how these modes of production are sustained. Yeah, well, one of the most revealing parts of your book is, is about labor and how the premise of this automate, automated future uh, that is going to leave you know, the world jobless is actually covering the realities of a 19th century kind of like brutal exploitation. So um, apart from the from the warehouse matrix that we were talking about before, where people are literally dehumanized to become part of this process where they work, work with the machines, you also write about the mechanical Turk workers that uh, Jeff Bezos calls um, I don't know if unironically the artificial artificial intelligence <laughs> because it's human pretending to be uh, artificial intelligence and Astra Taylor um, um, also um, um, a future guest of this of the series calls it Fox Tomation. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, which I thought it was uh, tragically hilarious. And you describe it as Potenkin AI and and. And, and we're talking about humans that are the actual neurons of AI. No, it reminds me of, uh, of the Samuel, Samuel Butler um, essay from, uh, from the uh, uh, late 19th century, where he was describing humans as the sexual organs <laughs> of robots. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and so I wonder if you think this training, this kind of exploitation, like this, this kind of solution <laughs> to the AI, difficulties or challenges is, is just a phase in the training or the um, producing of the AI itself or, um, or if this is just yeah something that is always going to be there as hidden, as, as subterranean as possible. Well, certainly, if we look at the ways in which contemporary labor is written about in these systems, you mentioned Astra Taylor, and, and I, I think photomation is, is certainly a fantastic way of thinking about the way in which we are presented with supposedly automated systems that are, in fact, back-ended by enormous amounts of low-paid human labor. Jathan Sadowski used this idea of Potemkin AI, again, a similar idea of the kind of mock houses sort of representing sort of villages that in fact behind them is, is absolutely nothing. There is a sort of emptiness. And again, what we find when we start to look at the labor conditions that are propping up technical systems is that there's an enormous amount of remote work that's being done on platforms like Mechanical Turk and many others, where people are in some cases training AI systems, in other cases, completely emulating a system. So to give you an example, in the book, I write about XAI, which was a service that was offering a digital assistant. And people were completely convinced that this was indeed an AI system that was helping them sort their calendars, plan their travel, etc. But in fact, of course, it was you know, hundreds of people who were actually 
in acting. They were play acting AI systems in order to do this work, often, you know, under extremely difficult conditions and 14 hour days, because of course the work of pretending to be AI is in fact extremely time consuming. Um, and in this sense, human, over and yeah. over again, <laughs> Precisely. It's in human. It's in human forms of labor. So, you know, by opening up these types of spaces, I think we can begin to see the, the layers of human labor all along the supply chain. And, you know, it's interesting because, of course, you know, the Amazon distribution warehouse, you know, the so-called fulfillment warehouse, uh, with all of the irony of that term, is you know, the exemplar in a particular way, it's sort of become the emblem of what hybrid work looks like when you have humans engaging in a space alongside robots and alongside algorithmic management systems. And it wasn't until going inside one that I fully understood and appreciated the extraordinary stress of being in those environments. Of course, I'd read about them, you know, there are, there are exposés, journalists have, have gone and worked in these spaces. But it wasn't until being within the actual uh, space of labor itself that I could see the extreme toll. You can see people wearing support bandages. You see the sort of the constant checking of the screens to check that people are maintaining the rate, the so-called picking rate, to make sure that you're getting objects and putting them into trays uh, quickly enough that you won't be penalized that day or that week. To see that work, I think it, it does act as a very particular type of presentiment, as a warning of what work will be like when it's in these types of um, forms of so-called bossware overlaid with uh, increasing forms of automation and photomation. So in that sense, for me, um, this takes us back, of course, to the Taylorist past and in many ways is really a, an extension of a vision that was had by the likes of people like Charles Babbage, who you know, is best known for you know, inventing the difference engine, but was also a social theorist who used to write about labor. And his somewhat horrifying imaginary was that people would become highly efficient in spaces of automation, that really humans were the most unreliable component and they had to be put in sort of remarkably restricted spaces in order to allow automation to do its work. In some ways, I think that sort of Babbage vision uh, is, is it's really kind of the, 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 the hope of the Bezosian kind of uh, mode of the Amazon fulfillment center. But in actual fact, you cannot escape the fact that it's humans all the way down and that humans are now being used as that connective tissue to make those systems work. Yeah, like one of the things that has struck me uh, as more revealing was uh, you pointing out that uh, that this warehouse, they're full of like um, vending machines that, that, that give um, painkillers to the workers, no? that they are surrounded by <laughs> machines that provide solutions i guess to their working right. conditions uh in the in the form well, exactly. of painkillers like i and, one wonder and of course if now yeah, I was just thinking that to 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 add to that Bezos's new solution, which he just recently described in a press conference, I think uh, less than a month ago, was that they're actually going to be using a system now which monitors at the level of ligaments and muscles to see that workers are actually, you know, distributing the labor of moving objects and parcels and boxes. So the surveillance mechanisms are actually becoming ever more granular in order to maintain that type of systemic control. Hmm. And you can see how that can become disguised as a totally different thing, no? Like we care so much about our workers that we want to make sure that their ligaments and muscles are working well and to prevent new injuries, I guess, um, horrifying. And also it, 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 is, it is hard not to think of how this is manifested also in the, you know, different ways we let little out, like supposedly automated uh, systems run our lives in, 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 in our houses, no? How in the attempt of uh, quantifying our existence to make it more productive, maybe not only at work, but also in different ways, not be a more, uh, I don't know, active mother or a better, um, you know, friend or even being more 
slender and healthy and eating the right vitamins and all that things that we are using assistance for how how we are enclosing ourselves in a smaller and smaller box just the way Charles Babbage imagined it exactly right and and it's interesting that that uh, framework and discourse of care work that these are systems that are designed to care for workers or to allow you to engage in forms of greater self-care and um, certainly when working with Laran on anatomy of AI uh, we went through all of the old Amazon patents and found one specifically for the Amazon cage and this was a system that was designed to protect workers as they work in spaces with, with many moving robots. But of course, the cage becomes such a powerful symbol of precisely how workers were having to adapt to the conditions of algorithmic and robotic work. Um, and it was interesting to see um, how this, this symbol, even though the cage was never built by Amazon, um, was then internalized to create vests, things that would beep and, and sort of respond to changes and conditions by controlling workers' bodies in particular ways. Um, and it was fascinating to see the artist Simon Denny actually build the cage after reading that essay. He was like, we need to see what this cage would actually look like. And he's sort of constructed this more than human scale so that you can see that vision. And I think it, it does act as this extraordinary uh, moment of visualizing what that relationship is for human workers in those spaces. Well, you can certainly say that's one of the tools that journalists could definitely use for researching this works, no? Because, you know, we know that, that um, as with politicians and most specifically dictators, you always have to uh, stop listening to what they are saying and start looking at what they are actually building and doing. And in this case, I would say that the best way to follow uh, the ambitions of the tech industry uh, in AI or anything else is definitely to look at their trying to patent, <laughs> you know, sometimes yes. very crazy things, but that give a, a very clear idea of where their, like, you know, ambitions are are placed in the future. And, and mm. I, I was wondering, like, thinking again about how there is all this fake, this Fox automation, um, how... Uh, we keep talking about how a number, a very small number of companies are trying to create a general purpose AI. And, and of course, the way we imagine it or the way they depict it, this is a winner takes it all game um, in the sense that uh, once they succeed, the AI becomes you know, not only the model of the world um, uh, we live in and also a manifestation of their culture, but also it becomes a totally opaque proprietary platform, more or less like Android or the iPhone, where other companies and developers and organizations and definitely governments and administrations will have to be building on top of, like building apps for. So the way things are going and knowing who is developing this uh, general purpose AIs, can you imagine a future where this is not what happens? There's many problems with the way that the trajectory towards so-called general purpose AI is being imagined. And even at the level of what a general purpose AI would be, I think is, is a moment for skeptical inquiry, because of course there is no such thing as, as truly general purpose AI, uh, that even there, I think we can see that there is this sort of operation of what the media scholar Alex Campolo and I call, you know, enchanted determinism, that these systems are described as being uh, magical and otherworldly and, and, and alien, sort of producing a type of general intelligence that sort of is separate from the humans that build the systems and the earth that's used for the energy, minerals and water that drive them. Um, yet at the same time, the sin is deterministic that they can produce this type of uh, prediction around how you know we should live, how the criminal justice system should work, how uh, you should receive predictions for the ideal employee, etc. So this this kind of uh, phenomena of enchanted determinism, I think, is is particularly evident not just in spaces where sort of deep learning systems are being discussed, but but also where we see this idea of so-called generalized intelligence. And if we trace that 
to the very root of that claim. It is sort of really based in this, I think, deeply problematic Cartesian dualism that you can create intelligence sort of separate from embodiment that is somehow, you know, computers do represent something akin to human intelligence, but simply, you know, surrounded by different encasings that we can sort of strip away the, the phenomenology of what it is to be embodied in the world and that intelligence can be abstracted. Here again, I think, you know, we see the sort of profound original sin of sort of early computational thinking that computers are just like human brains. Um, so again, I think what we'll find is that there are shifting goalposts in terms of what is being defined as general intelligence. And with each decade, the definitions change to suit what industry is producing. Doesn't it bother you uh, when it comes to uh, things like how do they call it now? Uh, yeah, industry 4.0, no? Like, you know, how this uh, big companies are building this, uh, or even this precision agriculture or precision health uh, platforms that are meant to be general purpose inside their own, like, enclosed uh, universes, I guess, in the sense that the precision health uh, assistant will be one that is as capable of determining the level of humidity in your skin uh, and see what, you know, nutrition you're lacking in order to get like the perfect luminous skin, or if something that just popped out of your side is, is uh, pot potentially uh, ca cancerogenous or not. Like, you know, for me, that would be general purpose enough. And, and uh, of course, after the pandemic year, we, I think there will be enough um, uh, incentive <laughs> to produce uh, to produce this uh, this sort of general purpose, yeah, general purpose AI for health, general purpose AI for you know agriculture, farming, general purpose, uh, general purpose enough, <laughs> I guess we can mm. say AI. And I'm wondering, like you know, since every company wants to compete every health system wants to compete <laughs> every like you know everybody wants to be on the same wheel of uh progress and uh and and get to the future at the same time as everyone else and and of course this this development is uh runs parallel to the uh to to the uh uh to the privatization of all the services, of all these infrastructures and all these uh, abilities, then uh, I wonder, again, maybe rephrasing the question, if you can imagine a world where it is not six companies that offer these platforms for everyone else, including governments, and, um, and, how, <laughs> and how would we get there and how would we resist uh, that you know, that potential or even already here reality. Mm. Well, this indeed is is possibly 20 questions wrapped in one and they're, yeah. they're all really important ones. And, and, and let's begin, you know, I think with this sort of ideological formulation of what it is to have an AI system that can resolve all healthcare problems or all uh, education uh, personalization, for example it simply doesn't mesh with how these systems are actually created and the longer we spend time i think here doing the excavatory work doing the analysis of the substrates of artificial intelligence the more you can reveal the way in which there is no such thing as a universal system that can be applied anywhere because in every instance they are ingesting vast amounts of data that carries with it its history, its context, its particularity, and the way in which currently, you know, training data for large-scale AI systems is seen as a simply interchangeable infrastructure that you could, you know, apply it to one healthcare system, or you could simply apply it to another, or you know, again, to a completely different industry. That 
that idea that you can have off the shelf models and training data sets that are infinitely applicable. I think this is you know, profoundly broken as a, as, a, as a method of production and has been shown to be so by you know, increasing numbers of investigations by people like Adam Harvey and, and certainly uh, in work that I've done in previous years with the artist Trevor Paglin um, and certainly now with researchers like Abiba Bihane uh, and Deb Raji. There are, there are many researchers now doing this work, actually looking at how this sort of claim to universality is in fact leading us astray from looking looking at the particulars, the type of world building that goes on in the production of AI systems. So, you know, here too, I think there's a methodological question to ask about how we should investigate AI is by sort of really, first of all, querying those types of ideological formulations and then returning with a far more rigorous form of investigation or, or you know, what Vladan calls detective work um, to really understand how they're actually being made. Um, so in that sense, you know, you then take us to the next question, which is the broader question of the political economy of AI, which is, right now, certainly one of the most concentrated industries in the world. I mean, you'd, you'd really have to go back to the railways to, to think of something that had sort of fewer players running such powerful and highly concentrated global infrastructure. And you know, you know, we could say that there are a dozen such companies um, around the world, although if we really look at who owns cloud architectures, we're really talking about sort of fewer than six companies. So in that sense, these are the same companies that also have the replenishing data pipelines that in addition to having devices that are giving them constant forms of images and text and social interactions and videos, they are also the ones that are, I, I believe, going through these processes of what we consider an enormous enclosure of the commons, capturing data from all sources that were previously seen as, as forms of publicly held information. So between those two kind of capacities for ingestion, I think we are seeing some winner-take-all effects in that if you already own the pipelines and the backbone and the data inflows, um, you will find that, you know, again, your capture of the market is, is extraordinarily strong. And that is why I think we have some very real questions to ask about what resistance will look like and, and how do you actually uh, move against that particular type of industrial formulation. Hmm. And you see how this capturing of the data can be real quick, no? Can happen real fast mm -hmm. because the, I mean, I'm thinking, for instance, about how previous to the pandemic, like there was like two, maybe two people that had the most um, amount of uh, genetic uh, like material in their databases. One of them was the Chinese government and the other one was a company called 23andMe, <laughs> which is um, which is remarkable, no? That we hate, we find ourselves in this predicament of needing to develop like pharmaceuticals extremely quick, and that the the ones in possession of the what is probably the most important material is not a network of uh, specialized universities developing, like quickly developing testing, uh, testing solutions and vaccine solutions, but uh, this one company that did not exist like three minutes ago. Um, this uh, I find um, um, almost stupefying. Um, it's the same, I have the same feeling about the fact that the big platform that even the smallest of, um, of agriculture, uh, you know, I don't know, person, uh, my English failed me there. <laughs> uh, the smallest of farmers um, and growers are using this uh, Bayer Monsanto uh, precision mm -hmm. agriculture um, platform that allows for them to know which part of their field is not getting enough water or how they can use the products of Bayer Monsanto uh, in a better, more um, productive way. But at the same time, they're like giving them the input of what kind of um, land they are working, like what kind of shade do they get, like um, uh, what works in what places. And, 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 and I always think about this idea that, um, that, uh, Scott was uh, was uh, talking about in in the eye of the state in in ways of uh, what was um, 
well, I don't remember, um, about how the civilizations that uh, remained anarchic, let's say, for longer were those that learned to grow potatoes instead of uh, wheat, uh, because, you know, you can pick them whenever you want and they grow uh, in secret, while wheat is something that is easily taxed and, and accountable for. And it has its own calendar, which seems to me like the first algorithm that was running humans before we even had machines. So um, all those elements combined uh, make me think that the most important issues of our time, which are related to health, water, food, growing, and, uh, and you know, bodies moving uh, in the planet are now held uh, into the hands of less than six companies, and we all know who they are. And uh, you talk about resistance uh, in your book, about how protesting, I don't know, um, AI systems in schools, for instance, and things like that is, is a way of, of, of resisting this concentration. But, um, but I do have the feeling that we've been resisting, uh, like with this sort of uh, um, collective action for, for quite, a while, quite a few years now, and yet the development of, this, of these technologies uh, is, is scaling really, really fast, and, um, and they are also invisible and uh, convenient for uh, most people. So I don't even know um, what would be the right tools for such resistance uh, that uh, to, to the level of, uh, you know, of arranging this infrastructure uh, to work for us instead of, uh, instead of uh, becoming uh, a tools for surveillance and control that we have now. I'm so glad you raised this issue of scale, because certainly it is, it's one of the operating metaphors of the Atlas of AI. And the reason that it is you know, constructed as an atlas is to work within these concepts of scale that have sort of concertinaed between what it is to be looking at sort of a specific singular system, to be looking at the interlacing of, as you say, systems of genetic data, farming data, uh, historical data about climate, uh, data around populations, data around uh, facial expressions, that, that these forms of data are being used to uh, draw particular types of correlations and assumptions, while at the same time uh, enclosing and capturing those types of data for the productions of profit. How do you protest and resist something which is so profoundly scaled? This is something that I think we've certainly seen early signs, and I would say just in the last few years, you're exactly right. You could look at some very particular types of, of political resistance. We could look at the banning of facial recognition in very specific locales like San Francisco or Portland or Somerville. Again, these tend to be quite uh, tech literate and wealthy populations, and they're very localized. They have very specific rules around, you know, where these systems can be used and where they can't be used. And, and so often the focus is on curtailing government use rather than curtailing the use by the private sector. And certainly one of the things that I write about in Atlas of AI is the way in which the private sector and the public sector are so profoundly entangled at the level of the way that these systems are deployed and harvested. So in that sense, one of the big questions that I've been asking in a current research project with the scholars Michael Medeo and Mike Anani is how might those politics of refusal also scale? How do we contend with refusal, not just being a local action, but at the level of network scale itself? And this, I think you're exactly right, is an open question. And it's a question that we currently don't have easy answers to, but it's certainly one that's happening at the same time as we are starting to see, I think, more types of social movements collaborating, working together, finding new coalitions around these kinds of questions. So in that sense, you know, 
I am optimistic that, you know, no system is complete, no technology is inevitable, and no politics is forever. Um, but certainly when it comes to what we should do next, this is a question that I think is going to require combinations of very, very different communities from around the world working together on these issues. Well, politics are definitely not forever, but infrastructures, um, uh, they tend to last uh, more than a lifetime. They seem to, uh, at least in this case. One of the most like protested, or let's say the topics about uh, where ab ab around where you find a lot of collective action is definitely the personal data. There is a movement for reclaiming that data. Uh, but as, as uh, Benjamin uh, was uh, stating recently in, in our second reprogramming uh, conversation, it might just be the wrong data, but not only because it is aligned with the purposes of their uh, creators and, 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 and embedded in, in its own or, or, um, or hounded by its own methodology, you know, like, like the one you described, which is one of exploitation and abuse and, and um, et cetera. But mostly because their their purpose, like their main goal, is not um, is not to help us manage, uh, mitigate, and and possibly overcome uh, the challenges that we face, like climate climate um, uh, challenges and weather and and weather extreme weather conditions. But because it is designed to exploit and and surveil people. So I wonder if you see a way in which this infrastructure that is already in place and or the one that is developing, uh, uh, you know, as we speak <laughs> at, at, at a very fast uh, mode could be repurposed, reclaimed or, you know, refocused uh, on on, you know, actual useful, useful um, uh, production of knowledge and predictions and uh, and and basically, uh, you know, management tools uh, for the, you know, for, for the use of uh, not only humans, but all species, I would say. So it, it is like mm. to reformulate the, the ambiguous question is in, in the best of all possible worlds. Um, do you see those infrastructures uh, possibly decentralized and uh, and useful? And, 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 and if this could be like this, planetary scale computation system that is useful for all of us and decentralized, uh, what do you think it would be capable of? Well, certainly, I think that Benjamin's vision of, you know, another type of planetary computation is possible is something that we will need to cleave to in the next few years, given that I think that so many of the systems that we are currently uh, seeing be developed are not actually serving those those questions around how to live on a planet under extreme climate strain. But at the same time, one of the things that concerns me is the way in which there is a consistent pattern to think about technology itself as the central actor and quote unquote solution to problems. And, and we see this quite commonly in the sorts of discourses, both in tech utopianism and in tech dystopianism. It's either, you know, the central actor that will provide us new ways forward, or it's the sort of the core problem, the sort of the potential seedbed of the singularity of, of the idea of sort of overthrow of human civilization itself. I think both of these types of analysis are, are very flawed because they take us away from, I think, the far more pressing question, which is how do we want to live? And how might these technologies serve that vision rather than drive it? And how do we begin to decenter technology as being the sort of the central actor in the stories that we tell about how we should live in the years going forward? Now, you know, certainly there are questions to ask about, I think, the, the tendency towards a type of uh, humanistic lens. And if there is one thing that we really do need to do is to sort of think in these, these broader ecological ways to sort of decenter humans also as being sort of the central actors of those stories. So in that sense, moving towards a more planetary uh, form of, of life, a way of thinking 
this experience of the next, let's say, 100 to 200 years of extraordinary change as how do we think collectively with other forms of non-human actors. The question is whether or not the systems that we currently have, certainly in the technological side, can be party to that. And this always takes me back to Audre Lorde, the idea of the master's tools cannot dismantle the, ma the master's house. You know, what is it going to be to ask these systems to become actors when they are indeed owned by so few and in many ways built with the ways of seeing that uh, designed for capital, for policing and for the military? Yeah. It's all right. Um, you, you, you don't see any repurposing of this. Uh, I don't see definitely a repurposing of this data. I wonder about the infrastructure, but mostly because uh, I think the most the most like relevant one might be the one that we are all carrying and you know feeding every day from our pockets and our like desks and etc. And that infrastructure is now is now in uh, very few hands. You can tell by just Apple and Google telling the European Commission uh, how their uh, you know COVID radar applications are going to be, um, which I thought it was an a scandalous, uh, extremely interesting moment, uh, uh, at least from a democratic perspective, I guess. Um, I would like to remind our listeners yet again that you can leave uh, your questions for Kate in the. Uh, in the box provider by, provided by Axioma. And, um, and I would like to uh, end uh, my part of this conversation by asking you, um, I, I do remember like some maybe a couple of books ago uh, talking to Naomi Klein about her book writing and, um, and she told me that she had this feeling that, that books were too slow that uh, that writing mm -hmm. books, which has been for so many, you know, for a century, like the tool for um, for, you know, public intellectuals to have an influence in the public life um, have become just too slow for the pace of politics in her case. And I was wondering if after uh, writing this, you know, <laughs> this amazingly well-researched and, uh, and, you know, and, and, and extremely important uh, book uh, that let's hope it has an impact in uh, administrations and, uh, and the management of uh, funding for future iterations of new AIs. Um, if you feel that book writing might be too slow uh, and you, you find that there are other uh, more productive uh, ways of of having an impact in this field um, at the moment. You know, it's interesting because, of course, you know, uh, I'm I'm reminded of the ways in which books are extremely time consuming and often very isolating processes. Um, they need to gestate, they need to marinate, and the writing process itself uh, is 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 so multi layered and involves so, just so much time and work um, on top of the field work as well that goes behind projects like this. One of the things that I find really I think for me exciting is to be working on different time horizons and while doing a slower project like a book is to be doing other sorts of projects that might have uh, shorter time horizons that you can release along the way. So in the ways in which say Anatomy of an AI System with Fladan was you know, one really important uh, genesis of Atlas. So was excavating AI with Trevor Paglin, which you know came out um, a year and a half later, and that sort of represented another sort of piece of the puzzle that I was working on. Um, and similarly, that idea that you can begin to create parts of the story, some of which will be books, some of which will be academic articles, but some of which will be talks, some of which will be uh, installations, some of which will be kind of completely different modes, films, animations, uh, you name it. Um, there's all sorts of, of, of crazy things that we're talking about building at the moment. And, and in that sense, I think that's how I personally contend with those those kind of pressures of time, because I, I feel that very keenly that 
we do have a moment in history that we do need to grasp in terms of changing the dynamics of the way in which artificial intelligence is currently being constructed and the ways in which it centralizes power. And you mentioned infrastructure. I mean, it's, it's such a key part of the work that I do is to study infrastructure. And what we learn is that once it has, you, as you say, sort of taken hold and been built, it's extremely difficult to roll back. So in that sense, you know, it returns me to your provocation of, is there a, a different type of infrastructural action? And I think we could almost look again to history and to think about what it would be to essentially nationalize infrastructures. Um, that is the, you know, the only way I think you could begin to reconceptualize what the planetary computational infrastructures are for. And that is a conversation that's being had in some quarters. You know, we're seeing uh, at the moment, I believe it was Ohio actually suggested that the attorney general is, is putting forward a bill to nationalize Google. Um, and it, of course, this is very unlikely to succeed, but as a moment of creating a different kind of infrastructural imaginary, I think it's, it's, it's a very uh, intriguing one. To be honest, when I was um, when I was following the uh, the drama with uh, TikTok and Trump, I I I had the like the intense feeling that that there was there was something to be learned from from there. Like what he was proposing was that if TikTok wanted to keep working in the states, considering that it belonged uh, to a Chinese company whose government had something uh, uh, of of a, of a uh, cybersecurity law that that you know that obliged every Chinese company to be providing all the data to the to a centralized uh, uh, I don't know uh, I don't know whatever <laughs> device uh, in the in the Chinese government. I thought, well, he's just imagining, he's just assuming this is the case. But we, for instance, in Europe, we do know by by fact, like we have the documentation that proves that. In fact, all the American platforms are using our data to provide uh, the American government with information about us that they don't really need to have, uh, at least from our perspective. And so um, I wonder what would it be if suddenly the European Union or even like, you know, a coalition of Latin American countries decided that if Google and Facebook and Amazon and, 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 um, and I don't know, Uber wanted to keep working uh, in our jurisdiction, they would have to sell their part. And how, how would that be, no? Like what coalition of companies or administrations could actually become the sudden uh, owner or administrator of those companies saying what could happen if that infrastructure could be put to work uh, in a context like a pandemic? Uh, under the GDPR, for instance. And I don't find, like, every time I say it, I have the feeling that that, that people think I'm crazy, <laughs> especially because I start <laughs> this, this uh, narrative saying Trump had an idea, which is always the wrong place to start. But, um, but I don't find it so, like, impossible. Like, I find it technically possible, politically appropriate and um, and mm -hmm. even fair. <laughs> like what's wrong with that Trump idea? Well, I mean, it, it, we, we could almost turn that idea on its head and, and say, is it actually uh, uh, the way in which nation states are going to have to band together to produce different types of economic pressure to compete with the para states that are technology companies? I mean, to give you a recent example from Australia, uh, Facebook, when in negotiations with the Australian government over a new media bargaining code, decided as one of its tactics to simply switch off newsfeed to cut that cord completely such that Australians were not actually able to see international news and Australian media organizations could not share their news internationally. It was an extraordinary moment, I think, of seeing the sort of 
iron fist being removed from the velvet glove and the realization that to try and create governance at the nation state level was to actually be in an extraordinary type of infrastructural war where entire types of capacities could simply be switched off at the tap. So in that sense, I think the idea of how nation states might begin to band together to actually exert different types of power in governance is a really genuinely interesting question and I think one that we have to ask. Certainly you can see that reflected in what's been happening at the EU with the new draft guidelines for regulating AI. It's the first ever omnibus legislation to attempt to do so. And while you would certainly have to commend the EU for starting to think about these types of regulatory mechanisms before many other parts of the world, you'd also have to say that as a sort of regulatory structure, it's it's extremely mild and it doesn't necessarily provide that type of uh, different power structure that can contend with technology power. So I think we're very, very early stages in thinking about what those coalitions would look like. But I like that you're going there, Marta. And I think that this is precisely the sorts of conversations we're going to need to have to reconceptualize governance in the 21st century. Well, I certainly you know, as a journalist, I love that you mentioned the uh, power struggle that happened in Australia not so long ago, because it was definitely a reminder of uh, of where the infrastructure is and uh, and what happens when you try to, you know, have some control over it. For instance, when you're having a pandemic and you need people to be uh, uh, aware of all the lockdown information and uh, and where a virus is moving etc so it was for me it was a very important moment of revelation a little bit like um at the level of again apple and uh, and google t telling the european commission how the how the apps for um for uh COVID would, would would work um not being elected uh, officials themselves uh, and not even being Europeans. Uh, it was fun to see how the countries that decided to keep going with their own solutions anyway had to uh, re <laughs> had to re remake their steps, I guess, uh, in order to make them work because 99% of the phones in the world are run by Android or by an iPhone uh, system. So, um, as much as I would love to just keep talking to you forever, I'm going to have to handle you to our three special guests. I think the first one is in London. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, my name is Nika uh, and I'm doing a PhD on stuff that you are kind of talking about now, which is proprietary analytics in the UK public administration. So about the prioritization of governance uh, through infrastructure. And I first have to say, Kate, your work is uh, was a very big inspiration in the past five years. So I was really waiting to, for something to cite in a book format as well. Um, and it's really a pleasure to be able to ask questions. Um, I really like the book because it's also a travel log. It also shows the, what is needed to learn what is behind the structures. Um, I'm sometimes a bit confused about your role at Microsoft, because I think that you have to be part of structures to know what's kind of happening as well. Um, and I'm mindful of different positions in which we can actually uh, produce knowledge. Um, my question I mean, I have many questions um, and you already addressed the issues with like writing books and different ways in which impact can be done. Um, my question also refers to the work of Benjamin Breton, um, because I feel that it's a bit when we talk about planetary computation and about global actors, uh, it's kind of a way to decenter perhaps the center. So responsibility should be more powerful. Um, and I was really thinking a lot about this AI systems and state actors proposal that you mm. wrote. Um, and in the end, I always think like we're not talking about so many different nation states that have a stake in it. 
uh, and sometimes decentering this from the US to different like planetary global structures um, prevents us to actually maybe make some change. So my question would be, as you're talking about scales, should we focus on certain scales and perhaps not be so abstract when it comes to um, the role of certain nation states? Uh, because for me, it seems as somebody coming from Slovenia doing research in the UK, that sometimes it feels like you can do more if you are actually addressing power structures somewhere else, not in the... Um, because we do, we do research in Slovenia as well on those questions, but at the same time, like the impact this research can have is very different. And sometimes like talking about planetary global computation just like makes everything very abstract and perhaps not impactful enough. So that's the question, I think. This is such a important question, Nika, thank you. And let me try and take it in different parts because there's, there's so much to say about precisely this question around the need for specificity in terms of where are the centers of power. And at the same time, that sense of infrastructure, which is planetary in scale. But I think it's, exactly right that what we don't want is in by talking about planetary computation we somehow blur the idea of who owns those infrastructures and who controls them um, and who do they, they they most benefit so in that sense you've you've done a very important thing which is to delineate where we can see the ai centers of power in terms of geopolitics versus who actually owns infrastructure at the planetary level. So in this sense, you know, I, I think very much about this current uh, rhetorical formulation that we're in an AI war, that uh, sort of the dominant objects of concern are the sort of supranational efforts of the United States and China, um, you know, with the tech companies in China, such as you know, ByteDance, Tencent, uh, Huawei, Alibaba, um, often framed as somehow being uh, representatives of Chinese state policy and therefore somehow more frightening in their representations of power than say Amazon or Google, etc. And I think in that sense, you know, we've seen this shift from what you know scholars like Wendy Chun and uh, Tung Hu Hui have noted, which is this idea that we used to have this kind of nebulous global vision of digital citizens who were, you know, collaborating and sharing power in this sort of, you know, abstract spaces of, of networks, but now has taken on a very different cast. This sort of, it's colored towards a far more paranoid vision of sort of defending national clouds against racialized enemies. And that shift, I think, allows us to look at specifically who are the sort of the sort of AI power centers and which countries are being figured as the AI client states. And that to me is actually one of the very key ways in which we bring specificity back into these debates to say, you know, where is AI being produced? Which nations are actually now saying these are the borders upon which our tech companies can work? And then, you know, to look at the ways in which those infrastructures are themselves exceeding the boundaries of the national state. They, they cannot sort of fit within uh, the nation state and are in fact, as you say, global. So we're contending with, again, these idea of different scales, scales at which power vests, scale at which you can say, this is how we can form legislation, say at the level of the nation state, but we're dealing with systems, companies, and networks that exceed those boundaries. So what you've pointed to, I think, is a fundamental tension that we have to contend with, both at the level of researchers, but I think also legislators have a very real contest in, in trying to balance those very significant differences in terms of where the infrastructure lies and where power to make laws actually vests. But I'm, I'm curious, Nika, in your work, you know, how do you see these types of governance challenges, if challenges even big enough a word, being resolved? Um, 
Well, I just started in September, so <laughs> like, I have the next. <laughs> so we have three years. Now. <laughs> I have three years to three years to find something that um, that will not be just a, like a book, but maybe also a policy proposal. But um, I think trying to understand infrastructure by doing field work. I'm planning to do field work if um, the government allows me to enter their premises. Um, but at the same time. Yeah, I don't know. Try to think of different ways to address um, stuff. But I didn't. I, I did. I couldn't get much further than AI systems, the state actors proposal. I think this is a really great idea. But I learned that you cannot transpose legislation from the U.S. common law practice to the U.K. Law, common law practice that easily. So I'm not that far. But I'll. Uh, I can keep you posted. <laughs> so let's see where it goes. <laughs> Please All right, do. well, I, I I'm sorry to, to interrupt you too, <laughs> but we need to go to uh, the studio and uh, and hear the questions from our other two guests in Ljubljana. Hi, uh, my name is Sanela, and first of all, thank you for this amazing discussion and food for thought. It's definitely a lot. Um, I would like to kind of start with what I read in the book and also what was heard in the discussion and maybe just try and also um, elaborate a little bit on things that um, I found really interesting and challenging. Um, and one of them is that um, it seems like these extraction methods in the development and application of these automated and automatizing systems are just um, in a way reproducing the current condition, which we are failing to regulate, but also maybe perhaps better effectively change. And they're not just reproducing it, they're also with each loop, each cycle um, amplifying it. So I wonder, because we see in so many cases that then the implementation of these technologies and their, the weight of these amplified effects fall on the already disadvantaged. My question might be a na naive one, um, but I would like if maybe we can talk a little bit more about how these um, logics of capital uh, monitoring, surveillance, targeting uh, can be challenged. And um, is it possible to imagine AI that would actually help us confront with the un injustices of the current system um, what would AI look like if guided by solidarity? Um, what, what it would be like, perhaps, if it would be reimagined from the other side of the power spectrum? So from those who are seemingly, let's say, the least able to resist uh, from the sides of political and social disadvantage. Mm. Fantastic question, thank you. And, and it certainly echoes Marta's wish, I think, earlier that we could find a way to uh, resuscitate and revive these infrastructures for different political formulations. Um, so let me begin by saying, you know, there is, I think, a, another type of, of question that I would love to bring out in what you just said, which is this idea of the layering of forms of capitalism upon each other, creating this amplification. I think you're absolutely right. But the question that I think haunts me and I think haunts you know many scholars in this space is do we actually consider this to be a different form of capitalism? Or as, you know, Mackenzie Walk writes, you know, is this something worse? Um, and certainly part of what I've done in Atlas of AI is to trace the histories from histories of uh, Fordism to histories of eugenics to histories of war and colonialism that we continue to live, not just in terms of the legacies, but that are sort of living forms of colonialism upon which these technical systems are built. So in that sense, you can certainly look to the idea of forms of political power that have been centuries in the making uh, are simply sort of receiving new layers and new forms of amplification. 
But then there's this question of whether or not these modes of abstraction and extraction are actually creating something new. And this is something that I, you know, I have long discussions with Mackenzie about. And I think we're all in the stage of, of seeing something now which is emergent and troubling and whether or not it, it constitutes a new form of capitalism, I think we are waiting to see, but certainly I think the signs look to me as though I, I believe that we are. But your, your second part of your question is this idea of, again, um, an AI in solidarity. And I can certainly point to real examples where AI systems can be used as a diagnostic tool. So you could think about all of the instances where we find AI systems producing forms of discrimination uh, or sort of overt forms of so-called bias. Um, I think about these as sort of the megafauna of the sort of classificatory underbellies of AI. Um, you could say that when Amazon's AI scanning tool was downvoting every woman who applied that they'd actually inadvertently created a diagnostic tool that showed the profoundly problematic hiring practices of the company that had been almost entirely hiring male engineers. And indeed, that's what the AI system was optimizing for. So you could think think about that as a form of, of seeing different types of social failures. But whether or not we can repurpose these systems for the needs of solidarity and for remaking the world in which we live, again, I, I don't want us to always have to see these systems as, as, as part of our solidarity and our political work, and that it might actually be really necessary to think about how to form those bonds and those capacities for political change outside of the forms of machine learning and centralized AI. Thank you. I love that you that you mentioned this case because I had exactly the same thought when when Amazon discovered that they were being actually gender biased in their in their historical records for hiring. Um, their solution was not to acknowledge the fact that this tool was going to improve their hiring culture, uh, but to stitch it, <laughs> which is like, are you really <laughs> proposing? that what just happened was not useful. It wasn't useful to you <laughs> if you don't want to change your hiring culture, but it was definitely extremely useful precisely as a diagnostic tool. And it will always give the same solution because there is very little noise in the, in the algorithm. So thank you, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, hi, and thank you for this uh, inspiring talk. Uh, I've also been following your work for quite a while. I've been a tech journalist for more than 20 years, I guess. Uh, and uh, AI, of course, is one of the topics that I cannot ignore, of course. Um, it, during the first part of your um, conversation, you also used this metaphor of space exploration. And it occurred to me that, in a way, uh, as we invented telescope to um, to see, you know, the objects that are too distant for our senses, and as we invented the microscope to spot, you know, the objects that are too tiny for our senses, uh, and uh, those, well, the two tools actually reconceptualize pretty much everything we know about space and nature and and, and the rest of it. And it occurred to me that maybe, in a way, a combination of machine learning and big data could be another tool, such as a microscope or a telescope. Uh, what do you think those tools will help us find out about ourselves and our societies? That's that's one question. The other is who will be watching and for what? And the third, uh, you were mentioning this question of scale a lot in your book, that uh, everybody can actually buy a microscope or a telescope, but you cannot build an um, AI microscope without all the data. And uh, only a few actors have this crucial component of this new tool. So will it be possible to, in a way, democratize this powerful new tool to actually enable all of us to do research on, let's say, human societies with this new tool? And thank you for this question. Um, certainly, I think that it, it 
grounds me back in the work of Lainey Destin and Peter Gallison in the work on objectivity and the emergence of mechanical objectivity as a way mm -hmm. of seeing that had to be a construction both of scientific forms of knowledge and institutions, but also the use of tools in particular ways to say that, you know, these are the tools that confer more neutral or objective or scientific results. I think certainly you could look to the way in which machine learning has become extremely dominant as a way of producing scientific results in, in, in multiple different domains, that certainly it is, it is becoming uh, a, a new form just in the way that we saw mechanical objectivity doing so in the 1800s. Um, you asked the question though, what will these forms of machine learning allow us to find out? And it is interesting that we can think of the level of the stars or we could think at the level of um, a melting glacier mm -hmm. and find that these types of uh, research are in themselves seen as somehow less problematic than research that is done on human societies and, and communities. And certainly I think that is predominantly the case. I'm, I'm much more excited in seeing how these tools will help, help us reflect on sort of non-human systems um, and, and to give us insight in ways that we previously would not. But it is the minute at which these tools are provided precisely for the logics of, you know, capital policing and the military, as we discussed, that the sorts of results that you get are immediately tainted by those types of objectives. And what we have to ask is, to what degree are these tools actually built with those ways of seeing within them. And certainly in the studies that I've been conducting over the last few years, you know, I would raise very real concerns about the way in which computer vision claims to be ascribing identity to human beings and to communities and groups, to ascribe uh, everything from gender and race to one's sort of morality or character or emotional sort of inner truth. These forms of knowing, I think, are always going to be serving precisely those types of interests that would not be, um, as you say, producing the types of societies we might wish to live in. And again, and the question is, who has these tools? Who has their hands on the levers? And until those forms of, of knowing are actually, as you say, more uh, reachable by different sorts of communities, then again, they're simply serving the most powerful interests. Thank you. All right. Well, I guess we could mention um, also the, the, like the program that that James Bridal did for the BBC Radio 4, uh, I think like almost a year ago, precisely about the new ways of seeing, uh, talking about how our, our idea of the world is defined by the tools that we use to see it. And, um, and what does it mean uh, for, you know, our, our future technologies also. Hi, Nature. So I think you do carry some questions from the audience. So I'm going to leave it to you. Yes. Hello to you both. Uh, and thank you, Marta. Um, I'm doing great, especially after this amazing discussion. I loved it. And Kate, I just loved reading Atlas of AI. We have selected three questions from the audience today. And the first one is coming from Anya Arich. They ask, your book is not so much full of maps and charts, but it does, in every chapter, put us in places we can clearly define. Is that why you decided to call it an atlas? And why was that important to you? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anya. I think the, um, the idea of the atlas uh, has many levels in the book. One certainly is this idea of allowing us to look at different levels of scale in terms of the production of of machine learning. But another is to sort of think about the way in which atlases are themselves unusual books. They allow us to recontextualize place and space in different ways. It allows us to tell different kinds of stories. I'm thinking here of the physicist and technology critic Ursula Franklin, who wrote about the ways in which maps 
are collective forms of knowing. And certainly in, in creating this book, I felt very much that I was drawing on the critical scholarship of many different fields and disciplines um, and many different scholars who have influenced and inspired me for a long time, you know, and that's that's certainly been, you know, everyone from, you know, Lucy Suchman to uh, Peter Gallison, who we mentioned, to Benjamin Bratton, to uh, Simone Brown, the list is very long. Um, but there's another way in which maps are relevant here too, which is that of course maps are uh, histories and, and trace the lines of power of domination over time. So we see the ways in which colonization has actually created its own types of atlases. We can think about the ways in which the borders that we understand are there to mark particular types of territorial battles. and. Furthermore, we can think about the great houses of AI and how they too are creating these sort of new atlases. And this is honestly very explicit in, in so far as the way that, uh, that many tech companies write about sort of creating singular, a singular atlas, a singular map um, of the world. And these proprietary maps are things that uh, I believe we must very actively work against to try and form different types of knowing, different types of uh, understandings of place and different atlases. So in that sense, I'm almost using the concept of an atlas against atlases. And to say that, you know, the atlas of AI itself, to think about AI as a sort of a centralizing form of atlas making needs to be in many ways questioned uh, and in some ways to be into that directly. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Adam Harvey asked the following question about face recognition. I've done research on the use of celebrities and public figures in the face recognition data sets and was wondering if Kate is aware that you're included in Amazon's celebrity recognition product. And if so, do you want to be removed? If not, how does it make you feel to learn this? For reference, Amazon face recognition ID is as quoted. I love this and hello, Adam. It's fantastic to have you here tonight, at least in my time zone. Um, and I want to have another shout out to your work in, again, critically investigating the data sets which have become so powerful in constructing these systems. I'm horrified, but not surprised to learn that I'm in yet another training data set. Um, and I think, in fact, almost everybody at this point can say that we are all contained in these training data sets once we start to look at things like Clearview AI, which contains over 3 billion images. Um, so yes, I do think that it's very important that we have the ability to be removed. And so the question here is, what are the mechanisms by which we can make that possible? Certainly, we've seen some really interesting pieces of legislation pass. I know that uh, BIPA is something that um, that we've discussed in the past. Uh, but again, we're talking about singular sort of state-based legislatures in the US. Um, we've now seen the EU's AI uh, regulations specify the need to have far greater controls over training data. That's a step, but what we want to see is exactly as you say, Adam, is way in which people can actually say, no, I don't want to be uh, in this training data set at all. And the other thing that I know that, that your work has raised and something that is a real concern here as well is even if I could be removed from this particular training data set, what would happen if that set continues to circulate on academic torrents? What happens if that training set is still being used to train large scale production systems? So I think we need to look to different forms of control rather than individualized opt out. I'm, I'm much more interested in thinking about how do we find strong legislative protections against non-consent based training data construction. Thank you for our third and last question. Oddly enough, the username Siri asks, what would you like people to do differently after reading Atlas of AI? Well, it depends who they are and, and, and what their sort of greatest hopes might be. I mean, certainly in, in this book, 
I argue that the way in which artificial intelligence has been defined and the way in which we, it is being publicly discussed is far too narrow, that it is in fact neither artificial nor intelligent, but part of a much larger form of you know, extractive computation, which is affecting so many levels of everyday life and much more widely the planet itself. So in that sense, my hope is that we begin to do a few things, but certainly that we begin to shift our time scales when we start to think of artificial intelligence, that we think about the way in which we are extracting minerals that took billions of years to form to serve a split second of technological time. That when we think about so-called automated systems, that we imagine the many types of human labor all along the supply chain to create that particular type of illusion. And that when we hear about the types of you know, digital exhaust or data that's being collected that will allow us to have ever more personalized and, and useful systems, that we might start to think about half-lives of that data, that we might think about the ways in which it becomes a form of haunting, not just us as individuals, but more broadly our communities and those who will come after us. So in that sense, my hope is that we not only begin to see these systems differently, but that we begin to say, here is far enough that we begin to start to delineate a boundary that says these systems cannot be applied everywhere to everyone for all things that in actual fact there needs to be a different type of politics emerging that can question and when necessary refuse these systems thank you kate marta and thanks of course to our online audience posing so many thought-provoking questions in the chat. This is all of our questions for today. So in the name of Tia Maxioma, I thank you again. And Marta, I give the mic back to you. Well, thank you, Nadja. It was good to see you as always. And uh, I think uh, it comes the time to uh, to call it a night, especially for Kate, because uh, <laughs> she is far away in Australia in a totally different time zone, which I'm right now very envious of because I'm in Berlin and uh, in the middle of what seems to be a heat wave. So uh, my brain is melting. <laughs> and um, I want to thank you. Thank you, Kate, not only for being here with us today, but also for the uh, amazing research and incredible book that you just put out. I want to recommend again, the Atlas of AI. It is a magnificent piece of work. Uh, it is an eye opener. And, uh, and, um, and at the same time, it is a, a, an extremely easy and entertaining read. So thank you so much, Kate. And uh, I hope to see you uh, soon in this part of the world. I hope that too, Marta. And can I say, it's just lovely to have this conversation with you. And thank you for taking this time in our very different time zones. And thank you to everyone at Axioma. This is a community which has done so much for advancing these questions, as well as the philosophy that will help us to more understand the way in which power circulates in these systems. So um, I'm delighted that we could spend this time together and I hope we can do so in person soon. All right. Well, I give the mic to you, Janice. Bye to everybody. Thanks, Marta. Thanks, Kate, for the insightful discussion. And thanks also to our guests in the studio and to all of you who decided to follow us and contribute to the debate through the web chat. After a well-deserved summer break, reprogramming returns on September 20th at 7 p.m. Central European Time Sharp with an episode dedicated to data. In that occasion, Marta Perano will be talking to artist and researcher Joanna Moll. To stay up to date on our programs, events and publications, follow us on social media or subscribe to our YouTube and Vimeo channels. That's all for today. Greetings from Ljubljana. Nas vidimo.